I read about a pastor, and this pastor was visiting a new family that was coming to their church. And this family, after many months, said to the pastor, we would like to become members of your church. And we've got a few visiting members here. And um, this particular pastor went and visited in the home of this family that was visiting. And the father of the family said to the pastor, what does your church have to offer my family? What does your church have to offer my family? And this pastor was very quick and he quickly said and replied, what does your family have to offer God's church? What does your family have to offer God's church? See, being part of God's family involves a certain calling. And we've seen, firstly, that we are called to grow in unity, but secondly, we are called to grow in serving God with our spiritual gifts. In verse 7 to 9, Paul is saying that to each one of us, Christ has graciously given us gifts. In verse 8, Paul backs this up by quoting and applying the psalm we read as our call to worship. He applies it by fulfilling it in Jesus Christ. Paul uses a familiar picture of his day. Now, there would be a Roman general going off to war. Now, Paul is writing to these Christians, and this picture would be very familiar to them. A Roman general going off to war. He defeats his enemy, and he leads his soldiers, and he brings back the captives through the city. And all the people are there surrounding this general coming in to the city. And the general takes his place in an elevated seat. And the general starts handing out different gifts from the plunder to the different people. And this picture would be very clear for Paul's audience. And Paul adds to this point of Christ graciously giving out gifts in verses 9 to 10. Christ who descended to earth on that first Christmas that we will celebrate in 52 days time. Christ who lived just like us, yet without sin. Christ who died that we celebrate this morning in Lord's Supper and rose to defeat his enemy, Satan. That he has freed us from Satan's captivity. And now we are Jesus, the mighty conqueror's captives, free, forgiven, Children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so Christ having descended to free us from Satan captivity and make us his captives, Christ ascends as conqueror and king alive into heaven. Look at verse, at the end of verse 10. Why? To fill all things. To fill all things with his presence. On the day of Pentecost, Christ poured out the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts on the church. The church, that's you and me, to power the church and its members, to grow the church and its members as each member, as each part of the body of Christ 
uses our gifts to serve God and His church. Each part of the body is important. There's no insignificant, minute member in the church family. Each member is important. Each member has a part to play. And the obvious question is, having the Holy Spirit living in us, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living in us, having the Spirit gifting us with a spiritual gift, how are we serving? How are we exercising our faith by using these gifts for our Lord? But the body of Christ needs building. I see a couple of personal trainers here. The body of Christ needs our muscles in our church being built up. It needs equipping. It needs to be trained. Well, Jesus Christ has that covered too. Verse 11 in our Bibles. He himself, Christ, gave some to be apostles. Sana did a wonderful job last Sunday explaining to us what those apostles were. Some to be prophets. For the early church, there were no scriptures that they could read personally. And so God gifted prophets to the church to give new revelation from God to His church. But now that God's Word is complete, that the canon is complete and closed, we don't need any more new prophets to give us new revelation. All that we need for life and salvation is found in God's holy word. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets. What's the next category? Sorry? Evangelists. Some evangelists. That word evangelist means in the Greek a teller of good news. Good news to unbelievers. We see that gift continuing today. And also some, the fourth category, some to be pastors. That word pastor, another word, could be a shepherd, a pastor teacher, someone that shepherds God's church, and someone that teaches the word of God to the members of his church. All four categories are Christ's gifts to Christ's church. And look at what these categories are called to do in verse 11 to 12. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets. Look at verse 12, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. To do all the work. Is that what it says in verse 12? No. Verse 12 says equipping. That word equipping means to make adequate. To cause the saints to be qualified. Another translation would have prepared. Equipping the saints. Why? For the work of deacons. The Greek there is the word that we get our word deacons from. To serve, to ministry, to service, and to build up the body of Christ. That's what God, through Christ, has given the church. Four categories of people to speak the word of God to the people of God, to minister to the ministers. 
with the word of God to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Some of us are not going to like what I am about to say to each one of us. But these are not my words. These are God's words. As your pastor and teacher, as God's gift to the church, His church here at the Christian Reformed Church of Casey, my calling is not to do all the work in the church. My calling, rather, is to equip, to train you, to prepare you from God's Word for the work of service, for the work of ministry. And by each one of us using our spiritual gift and serving the rest of the body of Christ, we are constructing, we are building up the church. So how are you being equipped? How are we serving God with our gifts for His church, for His body? You may be thinking to yourself, how long do you do this equipping for? Well, verse 13 tells us, until, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. That's how long we continue to equip and teach and train. That's a lifelong process. But Paul keeps going in this one long sentence in the Greek. Our calling is to grow in unity. Secondly, our calling is to serve God with our gifts. And lastly, our calling is to grow in Christ likeness. Look at verse 13. Paul says, Growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. What a high calling to each one of us that we're continually growing, that we're continually maturing from spiritual babies. Growing up to Christ-like, mature adults. How's your spiritual growth looking like? What's it looking like? In the newsletter, I asked that soul-searching question. We've been preaching all year about growing in Christ.
we are yearning and praying for more spiritual growth amongst us. That the Spirit's fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and self-control and goodness and faithfulness will be coming out of our lives more and more and more. Growing up, maturing in our faith. As God's word is faithfully preached and applied by us. As we use our spiritual gifts to serve each other. We expect to see us maturing into strong Christ-like members. And it's so important. It is paramount that we keep growing in the faith. Look at verse 14 with me. Then we will no longer be little children who are tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. This past Friday was really windy, wasn't it? It was a bad hair day for those with long hair. I saw pictures of people on the beach running for cover, tossed by those waves. With that picture in mind of blowing, being tossed around. The context of this verse is that false teachers were coming into the church at Ephesus. They were being cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, Paul says. And these church members were being tossed around. They were being blown around. This was happening in Paul's day. This has been happening since all of church history. And it's rife in our day today. Who of us saw the American gospel that we showed in our church? That showed each one of us how people twist the truth, the word of God, and make it into something so appealing and what our senses like to hear. And if members don't, are falling for this cleverly twisted truth, Members stay immature and their spiritual growth is stunted and we're easily tossed around as children. And we stay as spiritual babes. So what should we do then? What should we do? Well, pastors, you release me to spend a good portion of my week studying God's Word, looking at the words, looking at the context, and crafting a sermon to equip the saints from God's Word by preaching the truth. And this pulpit will always be faithful and give a good portion of our services to preach the truth, the Word of God, which is sadly lacking from so many churches that people go and visit. Members are called to attend church. We have 330 members in our church. But our average attendance is around 200. There's so many backsliding. Our members have to come to, on the Lord's Day to prioritize worship, to hear the truth being preached, and not only be hearers of God's Word, but also to be doers, to do, to apply the truth in our week ahead. But look at verse 15. Verse 15 also encourages us to speak the truth. Not only gorge the word and get spiritually obese in our head knowledge, but also we are challenged to speak, to gossip 
the gospel, the good news to those around us. What a calling to us as a church to grow in unity, to grow in serving, and to grow in Christ-likeness. And to also speak the truth. When's the last time? When's the last time you shared the truth with someone? can speak the truth in various ways. Husbands, we are called to lead our household and disciple our spouses, our children. A few Sundays ago, we baptized Jeremy and Amy's son, and we all made vows to nurture and to train our children. <coughs> In God's word. At our church, we are encouraging one-to-one -one discipleship. One of us connecting with just one other person. My dream is for our whole church to have just one person that we connect with once a fortnight or once a month. That we will speak the truth to one another. That God's word would be central in our ministries, in our growth groups, in our committees. That we would speak it, that we would speak it to each other more and more. Could I challenge you, as you're having coffee and cake, that you'll ask the other person, what do you think of the sermon? What truth, what word came that we could share with each other? We can speak the truth naturally. We can gossip the truth naturally where God has placed us in our workplaces, in our universities, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, through our ministries. You are taking the aroma of Christ and displaying that and speaking it when God gives you opportunities. Christmas is coming up. And we write each other cards. It's growing a little low at the moment. But find a card with scripture in it. Not a card with baubles and Christmas trees and decorations. Find a card or write a verse, a Christmas verse from the Bible of why we celebrate Christmas. Emails. Uh, some of us at the bottom of our emails have a signature. Edit that signature and add a verse at the end of your email signature. I visited some homes and I asked to go to the toilet. And the toilet is plastered with Bible verses and sayings. We are speaking the word. We are sharing the word. You may be thinking, uh, Pastor, uh, I, I'm no theologian. I don't know what to share. Well, I'm glad you ask and think that. Because uh, on your seats, Andre and I, thank you, Andre, for helping me, we put together some helps from God's Word. You can fold this up, put it in your Bible, um, put it on your kitchen fridge, wherever. But these are helpful scriptures that you can share, that you can speak the truth with someone going through death, someone who is depressed, someone struggling with family, someone struggling with forgiveness, someone struggling with value or identity. These are great helps and I'd encourage you, if you find another scripture would, that we could add to this helpful resource, that you would share that with me, and that we can easily add to our growing list. 
Also, if you have a Bible, a study Bible, at the end of it, use your concordance. Uh, look up the word that you're trying to share and speak, and the concordance will help you as well. But finally, Paul adds an important way that we should do this. Look at verse 15. He says, speaking the truth in agape love. We need to watch that as we share and speak the truth, we don't come across judgmental. We don't come across really blunt and sharp, but in an agape, sacrificial love. That we will have loving concern for our family and friends who are walking far away from the Lord. That we would pray for the lost daily as individuals. That we'd pray for the lost in our ministries and in our committees. That we would mix with the lost and invite them in. And when God gives us opportunities, we would speak the truth when in love and with love. And the purpose of speaking in love is in that we would grow in every way. In every way. In all of our lives, in our speech, in our thoughts, in our actions, as individuals and as the church into Christ Jesus. But this calling, this calling to live this way, is not just for some. But verse 16, look at 16 with me finally. But this calling is to each member within the body of Christ. Each member and each part needs to fit and knit together. That word in the Greek for fit and knit together is the word where we get the English word harmony. Harmony. On Thursday night, I babysat mum while dad was at choir. And I took mum to visit Else Viss for her birthday. And we finished up walking in the wheelchair with mum to the op shop in Danino, where dad was conducting the choir. And mum and I were humming, going through all the op shop. And the choir was singing in harmony. Each part, alto, tenor, bass, soprano, working in harmony. And that's the picture we get here. Each part needs to work in harmony. And each part needs to function properly by working on our calling to be growing in unity, growing in serving God, with our spiritual gifts and growing together in Christ likeness. This is my first morning sermon after Pastor Lamont has left us. And providentially, I've chosen a passage to preach on a kind of church that Paul wanted the church to be. This is the kind of church that I would like to be part of, that I would love to shepherd and teach and equip you and me, saints, for the work of ministry. And when each one of us, including myself, obey this message, obey this passage, we will be members growing and building itself in love. I'm praying for our church. I'm praying for each one of us that God will grow us together more and more like and in Christ. Would you join us in obeying God's word, in hearing God's word, and also doing it? Let's pray.